So I'm a third year PhD student. I do PhD in additive combinatorics at Manchester. And today I'm gonna talk a bit about this area. I'm, I will not give a comprehensive picture of what this area is doing. Rather, I will study a few questions which I think are quite characteristic of what we do in additive combinatorics. Um, so let me ask, let me start this with some sort of personal story. As uh, I was between my third and fourth year of, of my undergrad, um, I was trying to figure out what I want to do PhD in. I knew I wanted to do PhD in mathematics, but I didn't know what sub area of mathematics this would be. So at some point I came across this textbook on additive combinatorics. The kind of questions that were posed in this textbook were very interesting. Uh, so I figured then why not? Why not do PhD in, in this area? I applied to several places I got in Manchester. Um, but before several weeks before I was about to, to arrive in Manchester and start a PhD, I realized that I should probably know a bit more about what additive combinatorics is. So as to you know not uh, completely embarrass myself in front of my supervisor. So I was looking for some, some papers on, on additive combinatorics. And I came across these two articles by a Hungarian mathematician, Imre Roja. So what, what I'm going to talk about today all comes from these two articles, and they will be referenced in the last slide. Um, so that's the end of the personal story. Now let me try to tell you what additive combinatorics is about. Um, so one, one expert said that additive combinatorics is like pornography. It's hard to define it, but you know it when you see it. So I will not aim to define what additive combinatorics is, um, instead, I will give you these three problems, which I think illustrate the nature of the field quite well. Um, so in terms of notation, throughout this talk, bolded n will denote the set of natural numbers without zero. And I will denote the cardinality of a in the traditional way. Cardinality, let me remind you, is the number of elements that the set a has. So the three questions that I will discuss today are of the following form. Um, the first question is this, how big can a subset of natural numbers be if it lacks solutions to the linear equation x plus y equal to z? In the second question, I will modify the equation slightly. I will look at the equation x plus three y equal to two z. And finally, I will look at one more equation, x plus y equal to u plus z. Um, so these three equations may look similar, but as you will see throughout the talk, there is a very big difference between the first two of them and the last of them. And during the talk, I will try to explain where the difference lies and what consequences it has for, for our problem. So before we start answering the question, we have to ask ourselves, how do we even measure the size of subsets of natural numbers? Because after all, we want to know how big can a subset be if it lacks, if it has certain property, if it lacks a solution to certain equations. So there are several ways of measuring the size of subsets of natural numbers. And let me discuss them in an ascending order of relevance for our question. The sort of most natural way is cardinality. So uh, cardinality is just the number of elements that a set has. Now, card cardinality is a good way of measuring the size of finite subsets of natural numbers. It's basically their way. However, the problem starts when we start discussing infinite subsets of natural numbers. Uh, if you recall from your early math courses, all infinite subsets of natural numbers have the same cardinality. What this means is that there is as many natural numbers as there is primes, for instance, or as there is odd numbers. And because of this, cardinality does not allow us to distinguish or compare the relative sizes of different subsets of natural numbers. Uh, because you know there is a clear sense in which the set of primes is much smaller than the set of natural numbers. So we want to come up with a notion that makes this intuition more precise. So the, no the next notion that we can discuss is the notion of asymptotic density. Given a subset of natural numbers, its asymptotic density is basically the proportion of all the natural numbers that are contained in our set A. It's defined the following way. Let's try to unpack this definition. Um, so the fraction that you can see is the proportion of natural numbers up to n that are contained in the set A. And to define asymptotic density, we take this limit as n goes to infinity.
And um, we will call a subset of natural numbers dense if it has positive asymptotic density. And we will call it sparse otherwise if the density is zero. So for instance, the set of even numbers, so the set two, four, six, eight, et cetera, is dense with density one over two. And let's see why this is the case. Um, up to n, there are roughly n over two even numbers. So this fraction in the definition of density will be roughly at one over two, and it will convert to one over two as n goes to infinity because the error will become smaller and smaller. Um, and this, this quantity one over two captures what's, what intuitively makes sense, namely that every other natural number is even. So that's how we should think of density. It's, it's the proportion of natural numbers that are in our set. Let's look at some other example. The next example that we could look at is the set of primes. Uh, the set of primes will be sparse. If you studied analytic number theory at some point, or if you, or if you didn't, then you will learn that up to n, there are roughly n over log n primes. This result is known as prime number theorem. So if we look at the, if we try to compute the, the density of the set of primes, and if we look at this, this fraction that shows up there, then we'll be able to see that the proportion of primes up to n is roughly one over log n. And since log n converges to infinity as n goes to zero, so as n co converges to infinity, then this fraction will converge to zero as n goes to infinity. And hence primes have density zero or are sparse. Let's look at one more example. Let's take a set of powers of two. So the set of the form one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, etc. It's quite easy to compute that up to n there are roughly log two of n primes, sorry, log two of n powers of two. And so if we compute the, if we want to compute the density, if we look at this fraction, then uh, the proportion of powers of two up to n is log two of n over n. And uh, this goes to zero as n converges to infinity. One way to see it is that the function n grows much faster than log two of n. If you want to do it in a more precise way, you can just apply L'Hopital's rule to this expression and you'll get the limit. So um, one take, take away from this slide is that um, density is a pretty good way of, of giving us the size of dense subsets of natural numbers because it gives us a, a, a positive quantity that describes the proportion of all natural numbers that fall into the set. However, the moment we start talking about sparse sets, density stops being useful because it doesn't allow us to distinguish between various classes of sparse sets. It doesn't allow us to compare the relative sizes of various sparse sets. So despite its usefulness, density is still not exactly what, we're, what we want to get. And we will need one more notion. So the third and the last notion that I will discuss is the, what I'll call the rate of growth of a set. So what do we want to do? We look at the number of, for each n, we want to look at the number of uh, natural numbers up to n, which are in our set. And we want to find a nice function that describes, uh, describes this quantity. What do I mean by nice function? So we want this function to be of a fairly simple form. Like we want it to be a linear or a uh, maybe polynomial function or maybe a logarithmic function or some combination of all of these. Um, and let's, let's work out some examples to see how this works in practice. So for instance, if we take the set of even numbers, then I've, I've told you that up to n, there are roughly n over two even numbers, right? So we can take the function n over two to be this function that describes the rate of growth of, uh, of the set of even numbers. If we take the set of primes, then uh, up to n by prime number theorem, we have roughly n over log n primes. So uh, this is the growth function that we can take. If we take the set of squares, for instance, then up to n, there are roughly square, square root of n squares. Uh, that's not hard to establish. We can take this function to describe the rate of growth of the set of squares. For powers of two, up to n, there are roughly log two of n powers of two. So again, this is a pretty nice function. We can take it. 
And for instance, for Fibonacci sequence, um, we know that uh, up to n, there is roughly log phi of n Fibonacci numbers, where phi is the famous golden ratio. So we can take this function to describe the number of Fibonacci numbers up to n. So you can see that for each of these sets, I found the relatively straightforward function, which, which shows us how the number of, uh, of, of elements of the set grows up to n. And the reason why we like the rate of growth is because it allows us to compare relative sizes of various subsets of natural numbers. So for instance, there is a, you know, we, we know that there are many more even numbers and there are primes. And the precise way of saying it is that up to n, there will be roughly n over two prime, n over two even numbers, whereas up to n, there will be only about n over log n primes. And since the function n over two grows much better than n over log n, uh, we'll be able to say in a sort of informal way that there are more even numbers than there are primes. One formal way to compare these sizes is to use what we call asymptotic density. So if we have two functions from the set of natural numbers to uh, the set of positive real numbers, then we can use this asymptotic notation here. I will say that f grows no faster than g, um, or f is big O of g. If there exists some absolute constant, some absolute positive constant c, such that f is always bounded by, by c times g. So for all n, f of n is at most c times gn. And this constant c importantly does not depend on n. That's, that's the important thing here. So for instance, with this notation, we can compare some, some, some nice functions that, you know, that we've all learned about. So for instance, um, log n grows uh, no faster than any positive power of n. So for instance, it grows no faster than the cubic root of n. Uh, and then cubic root, root, for instance, grows no faster than the square root of n, which in turn grows no faster than n over log n, for instance, again. Um, this function grows no faster than n, which in turn grow no faster than n squared or n cubed or, or any, any power of n greater than one. However, any polynomial function in n will grow no faster than any exponential function in n. Uh, so for instance, n squared will grow no faster than e to the n or two to the n or three to the n. Um, but uh, exponential functions, however fast they grow, they are still not the fastest functions growing. For instance, we can uh, bound the, the growth of the exponential function by the factorial function, which grows even faster. And you know we can find faster and faster growing functions if we want. And the way to compare their, their, their rate of growth is to use this asymptotic notation. Another and related notation that I will use is this. So um, I will say that f and g grow at asymptotically the same rate if f grows no faster than g and grow, g grows no faster than f. So what this means in practice is that there are two absolute constants now, which I'll denote little c and bc, and big c, sorry such that f is bounded from below by little s, little c times g, and is bounded from above by big c times g, okay? Um, and the important thing about this asymptotic notation is that it ignores constants in front. So with this notation, for instance, the function grow n grows asymptotically at the same rate as the function one million n, for instance, uh, because up to constants in front, uh, b b because we can bound n by, from above by one million of n, but we can also bound one million of n from above by some constant times n. And for our purposes, these constants in front will, no, will not matter. One reason is that it's often hard to determine what these constants are. And um, another reason is just that we simply don't care. And uh, also, if we can determine what these constants are, they, are often, they often tend to be very big. And so uh, we are too ashamed of ourselves to, to you know, put them there and this time we want to ignore them. So let me summarize this asymptotic notation because uh, I'll use it later on in the, talk, in the talk. So f grows no faster than g or f is big O of g if f is bounded from, from above by some constant times g. And um, f and g grow at the, at the same rate if 
f grows no faster than g and g grows no faster than f. And it is a notation, again, we don't care about constants in front. That's something that we ignore completely. So that's the end of the asymptotic notation part of the talk. And by now, I think I've given you some convincing ways of describing sizes of subsets of, infinite, of, of natural numbers. And now let's try to apply this in practice and let's go back to the original problems that I advertised. So the first question that I want to ask is how big can a subset of natural numbers be if it contains no solutions to the equation x plus y equal to z? And uh, here the answer turns out that we can find quite a big subset of natural numbers that has no solutions to this equation. In particular, we can just take the set of odd numbers. If we take odd numbers x, y, and z, then x plus y will be even. And so it's not possible for three odd numbers to satisfy this equation. If I want to prove it you know, in a precise way, then I can say that if x, y, and z are odd numbers, then they are all equal to one mod two. And hence, x plus y will be equal to zero mod two, whereas z will stay as one mod, mod two. So it's not possible for x plus y to equal z. OK. Um, and the, so, so I said that the set of odd numbers is a big subset of natural numbers. What do I mean by that? Um, since the set of odd numbers has roughly n over two elements up to n, then uh, what I'm going to say is that there exists a subset of natural numbers whose size grows like uh, the function, like the linear function n, with, which has no solutions to this equation. Okay, and if a set of if a subset of natural numbers satisfies this growth property, then I will usually refer to it as being a big or a large subset of natural numbers. So that was the first equation. Let's see what happened in the second equation. Now we're going to look at x plus 3y equal to 2z. Um, so we can try the same trick here. We can look at the set of odd numbers. We can see if maybe the set of odd numbers has solutions to this equation, or, or maybe it, or, or whether it does not have. Um, so let's let x, y, and z be odd integers again. That means that they're equal to 1 mod 2. Um, However, if we do this, then x plus 3y equals to 0 mod 2, and so does 2z. 2z also equals to 0 mod 2. So the argument that we used before does not allow us to conclude in this case that the set of, integer, that the set of odd integers will have no solutions to this equation. And there is a good reason why this argument doesn't work, and the reason is that the set of odd integers does have solutions to this equation. So for instance, if we take x equal to 1, y equal to 3, and z equal to 5, then they all satisfy this equation. So um, the set of odd integers is big, but it has solutions to this equation. However, it turns out that if we slightly modify this method, if we slightly modify the set, then we can still get a pretty large subset of integers that has, uh, that has no solutions to this equation. So look, let's look at the set of the form 3n plus 1. So uh, these are numbers which are equal to 1 or 3. And these include 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, etc. So if x, y, and z are elements of the set, then they all satisfy this, this congruence property. They're all equal to 1 or 3 by definition. So it follows from this that x plus 3y will again be equal to 1 or 3. However, 2z will be equal to 2 mod 3 now. So in particular, it's not possible to find elements of the set which will satisfy this equation. And um, it's not hard to see that up to n, there are roughly n over three um, elements of the set. And so we can conclude that there exists a subset of integers whose size, again, grows like asymptotically like the function n, and which has no solutions to this equation. So um, let me try to you know, make some, let me try to infer something from these two examples that we've discussed so far. So both of the equations that I've looked at can be rewritten in this form ax plus by plus cz equal to zero, where a, b, and c are now some integer coefficients. And more generally, we're interested in linear equations of this form, where again, the coefficients are integers. Um, so based on the two examples that we've seen so far, we might maybe make a guess like this. Is it true that any equation of this form, there exists a subset of natural numbers whose size asymptotically grows like n, and which has no solutions to, to this equation. 
Okay, it seems a pretty natural guess. It worked for two examples. Why wouldn't it work for every other example? That's how we make inferences in math. We look at two and three examples and we try to generalize it to everything. I was joking, don't do this in proofs. I will give you zero points. Um, so let's look at the more at the general equation of this form. Um, here is the question again. Is it true that for each such equation we can find a large subset, a set whose size grows like the function n and which has no solutions to this equation? And the answer is no. Um, but to, to discuss this answer, it turns out we need to divide all these equations into two classes, which depend on the coefficients. So from now on, I will call the equation invariant if its coefficients sum up to zero. And otherwise, I will call the equation non-invariant. And it turns out that, that this is a, a the sort of key distinction here that we have to make. Um, let's look first at non-invariant equations, uh, because the equations that we have discussed so far are indeed non-invariant. Uh, so the equation x plus y equal to z can be rewritten as x plus y minus z equal to zero. And it is non-invariant because it's their coefficients sum up to one if we, if we sum them up. And one is clearly not zero, unless we are in zero ring, but we are not. Uh, the second equation that we've looked at is also non-invariant because if we rewrite it in this form x plus 3y minus 2z equal to 0, then its coefficients sum up to 2, and 2 is non-zero again. Um, and in fact, we can make the following general theorem. Um, suppose that we have a non-invariant equations, then we can find some m and l such that the set of the form l, l plus m, l plus 2m, l plus 3m, etc will contain no solutions to this equation. And um, so this set is a generalization of the set of odd integers that we looked before, or of the set 3n plus 1 that we've looked before. And um, we observe that this set will asymptotically has size uh, will at most n over m. And so this rate of growth function will grow like the function n. And so for so, so the conclusion is that for all non-invariant equations, we can find a large subset of natural numbers, which has no solutions to this equation. So that's the non-invariant case. That's the sort of easy case. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I will discuss an example of an invariant case. And more precisely, I will discuss this equation of the form x plus y equal to u plus z. This equation is of extreme importance to a lot of areas of mathematics, not only combinatorics, but also number theory, graph theory, uh, dynamics, it shows quite a lot. And it even earned a special name, it's called Sidon equation. So the kind of question that I'm gonna ask is how big can a subset of natural numbers be if it has no solutions to the Sidon equation? Um, sets that do not have solutions to this equation are called Sidon sets, unsurprisingly. Uh, and if you want to read up a bit more about them, after the talk, you can just type Sidon sets or Sidon equations in Google, and you're likely to find some stuff about this. Uh, before we discuss this question, there is some class of solutions that we have to reject. Uh, because this equation is invariant, it will have what we call trivial equations. So observe that if we take x and u to be the same elements, and y and z to be the set elements, then we automatically get a solution to the equation. Similarly, if we take x and z to be the same elements and y and u to be the same elements, this gives us a solution to the equation. So uh, whenever we have a non-empty set, it will have a solution to the equation because if the set contains only one element a, then we can let all of the numbers to be a and this satisfy the satisfies the equation. Um, so these solutions appear always and because they appear always, we will call them trivial and we will try to ignore them because they don't uh, you know, they, they make the problem uninteresting. So the modified question that I will ask is this, how big can a subset of natural numbers be if it has no non-trivial solutions to this equation? And here's the answer. Um, for each natural numbers B, uh, natural numbers N, sorry, the largest subset of, of natural numbers up to n that has no non-trivial solutions to this equation 
will asymptotically have size square root of n. Okay. And uh, why is this interesting? For non-invariant equations, we could always find a set of size that was uh, of size roughly n, which had no solutions. But here we, we cannot find a, such a large a, such a large set with no solutions. Here, the best we can do is square root of n. And you know, for large n, the number n is much, much greater than square root of n. So uh, there is a, a very clear difference in the result that we get here compared to the results that, we, that we've seen before. Um, so uh, I was told at some point when I was an undergrad that a good talk should have one joke, one definition, and one proof. Um, I think I've already had a joke. I had more than one definition. And now I'm going to have one proof. Uh, and I'm going to prove that if a subset of natural numbers up to n has no non-trivial solutions to the Sidon equation, then it will have size at most twice the square root of n. Now, the thing with listening to the proofs in the talk is, is this. If you don't get the proof or if, if you're not interested, then just feel free to skip the next few minutes. Uh, but if you want to understand how results in this area are proved, then I think this proof might be a bit illuminating. Um, but if you lose track of, uh, of the proof at some point, then just feel free to return to us when the proof is over. So uh, that's the statement that I'm going to prove. Um, I will need one inequality, uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality. And um, before I will state what this inequality says, let me remark that there are two inequalities in math that are of extreme importance and th that are used in every area of math that has anything analytic to do. Uh, the first of these is the triangle inequality, and the second is the cauchy schwarz inequality. It exists in a lot of different forms. Here I'm going to state just the form that I need in this particular problem, and uh, it works like this. If f and g are some functions defined on integers up to n, and which take real values, then uh, if, I take, if I look at the inner product of the functions f and g, it's square, is bounded from above by the sum over the squares of f times the sum over the squares of g. Okay, so it's as simple as that. In particular, I will need this inequality in the case where g just takes values one at, in, at each integer from, from one to big n. And in this case, what I'm gonna say is that uh, the square of the sum of f is bounded from above by big N times the sum of the squares of F. Um, where does the big N come from? Uh, if G is one, then G squared is also one. So the sum over the squares of G will just be N, the, the big N, and, and, and that's why I have, why I have the big N here. So that's the cauchy schwarz inequality. And uh, let me now use it in the proof of the statement that I promised, namely uh, in the proof that each set lacking non-trivial solutions to the Sidon equation has size at most twice the square root of n. Um, okay. And uh, to do this proof, I'll need to define one function. I'll denote it as little t of n. So what this function is doing, it, uh, it counts pairs of elements from a that sum up to little n, okay? And uh, let me now look at the square of the size of a and try to rephrase it in terms of the function t. So the square of the size of a is the same as the number of pairs of elements in a. That's the first equality. Um, now, if we have each pair of elements in a, and it sums up to some number between one and two big n. Uh, so I'm going to rewrite the sum as follows. I'm going to sum over all the numbers from 1 to 2 big N. And I'm going to look at the number of pairs of elements of A that sum up to, 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 to a number N. Um, so that's where the second equal, what the second equality here means. And this count of, of the number of pairs that sum up to little n is just T of N. So uh, what I've shown here is that the square of the size of A is the sum of the function little t of n. Uh, and, uh, and the sum is from 1 to 2 big n, because uh, if a takes elements in, in the set from 1 to big n, then uh, every sum of two elements from a will, will, take, 
will, will, will be between one and two big n. So that's the first uh, first quantity that I'm going to rewrite here, that I rewrote here. I'm now going to look at another quantity. So what you see on the left is the number of all the solution tuples to the Sidon equation in A. So this is the number of all the tuples x, y, u, z that belong to the set A and that satisfy the Sidon equation. And I'm going to rewrite it in the similar fashion. So let me observe one thing. If x plus y equals u plus z, then this means that x plus y equals to the same number little n as u plus z. OK, so I'm going to rewrite this count as follows. I'm going to sum up again over all the possible sums, all the possible sums little n. This ranges from 1 to 2 big n. And uh, x plus y has to sum up to n. So um, I'm going to look at all the possible pairs x, y that sum up to little n. And u plus z has to sum up to little n. So I'm going to multiply this by the number of all the pairs u, z that sum up to little n. Um, and each of these counts is the same as t of n. So what I've arrived at here is the sum over the square of, of t for all the values of little n that are possible here. So uh, in the first expression that you've seen, I uh, basically uh, gave an, an alternative formula for what the sum of t is. Here I gave an al alternative formula for what the sum of t squared is. And uh, by now, I haven't used in any way the assumption that the set A has no non-trivial solutions. And I'm going to do it now. So um, if A has only trivial solutions, then they are of the form x, y, x, y, or x, y, y, x. These are the only possible trivial solutions that the set A may have. Um, so the number of solutions of the form x, y, x, y is uh, the square of the size of A because we're just counting tuples x, y that, that belong to the set A. And similarly, the number of solutions of the form x, y, y, x is also the number of pairs of the form x, y uh, in the set A. So the number of such pairs or, or of such trivial solutions is also the form uh, the square of the size of A. So in total, the number of all the trivial solutions to this equation is at most twice the square of the size of a. And uh, so, so the quantity that you've seen in the, in the, that you can see in the middle of the slide, so the number of all the solutions to the Sidon equation in the set a will be bounded from above by twice the square of the size of a. And now with these three informations, I'm going to combine them all together using the cauchy schwarz inequality. Uh, so let me start with the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, I'm taking the fourth power of the size of a. I know what the second, what the what the square of the size of a is. Uh, so I also know what the fourth power is. The fourth power of the size of a will just be the square of the of of t over different values of little n. Now I'm gonna use the triangle inequality. So this is bounded from above by the sum of t squared times the sum of the function one where we sum it up from one to two big N. Um, the sum of T squared is the number of all the solutions to the Sidon equation. And this, as I argued before, is at most two times the, the square of the size of A. Um, so if I combine this all together, then what I'm getting is that the fourth power of the size of A is bounded from above by four times N times the second power of the size of A. And if I now solve this inequality, this gives me that the size of A can be at most twice the square of N. I'm gonna pause here for about 10, 15 seconds to let everyone take a breath and take a look. So if you did not follow this proof or if you stopped following at some point, um, then 
I guess now we can come back. Welcome again in our company. Uh, and then let me sum up a bit what I've talked so far about this equation. So we have shown that if a subset of natural numbers up to n lacks non-trivial solutions to this equation, then it has size at most twice the square root of n. And in fact, using more refined techniques, we can improve this bounds to something like this. So here the term involving, so here we have the bound square of n plus lower order terms. Uh, and that's that's the best upper bound that I think we have at the moment. In terms of the lower bound, we can get a lower bound of this form. So we can show that there exists a subset of natural numbers up to n with no non-trivial solutions to this equation and which has size at most square root of n minus some small some some lower order term. So if we combine these bounds these bounds together, then we see that the largest subset of integers up to n having no non-trivial solutions to certain equation has size between square root of n plus something on the, on the right and square root of n minus something on the left. So in particular, we see from this that the larger subset of natural numbers up to n that has no non-trivial solutions to certain equation has roughly the size square root of n. Okay, and that's all about the Sidon equation. But it's natural to ask, well, what can we say about more general invariant equations? Let me recall that an equation is invariant if the coefficients sum up to zero. And um, I think one takeaway that's sort of obvious after seeing everything that I've talked about for Sidon equation is that it's much harder to give reasonable estimates for the size of the largest subsets of natural numbers lacking solutions to invariant equations than it is to give such estimates for non-invariant equations. For non-invariant equations, the question is basically solved. Whereas for invariant equations, well, not really. It turns out that for invariant equations, uh, for a general invariant equation, the best bounds that we can get are of this form. So the best upper bound that works everywhere is n over log n for uh, to raised to some small power. This power will, will depend on the equation. Whereas on the left, uh, the, the, the lower bound, the, the best lower bound that we can get is uh, some small power of n, which depends on the number of variables that we have. Um, and um, so for instance, for the Sidon equation, what, this, what these bounds tell us is that the largest subsets of natural numbers up to n not having non-trial solutions to linear to, to Sidon equation will have bounds between bounds of this form. And you know this is much much worse than the bounds that we that we obtained. That we we basically shown that the largest subset not having solution to this equation will be roughly of size square root of n. Whereas here we have the cubic root of n on the left, and we have some n over some small power of logarithm on the right. So this is way way worse than what we've seen by directly attacking this equation. And uh, in general, like we have this gap here between what we can show in the general case and what we can show by looking at some specific examples. So there is still a lot of open questions that are that you can ask about these types of equations. And uh, I think it's time to conclude and uh, I'll, I'll summarize what I've talked about throughout this talk. So the general problem that we've been interested in uh, was about finding the size of the largest subset of natural numbers up to n that lacks solutions to a linear equation like this with some integer coefficients. One thing I uh, showed and I hope I emphasized strong enough is that it matters a lot whether the equation is invariant or non-invariant. And to remind you, the equation is invariant if the coefficients sum up to zero. Otherwise, we call it non-invariant. In the non-invariant case, like in the case of x plus y equal to z, or x plus three y equal to two z, we can always find a large subset of natural numbers that has no solutions to this equation. And we can even explicitly describe what this subset is. So we know a lot. In the non-invariant case, in the, sorry, in the invariant case, however, this is not possible. And in the invariant case, we have to modify the question slightly. So we have to ignore all the trivial solutions. Um, so for instance, we have to ignore all the solutions where the variables are all the same. Because, and that's because the, the invariant uh, assumption implies that each non-empty set will have a trivial solution to this equation. And so for instance, for the Sidon equation, 
the equation of the form x plus y equal to u plus z. The largest subset of integers up to n with which has no non-trivial solutions has size approximately the square root of n. And this is much worse than what we have seen for non-invariant equations. So this is the end of, of me talking. Thank you very much for listening to the talk. These are the two papers that I referenced at the beginning. They contain pretty much all the material that I've discussed today and much, much more. Uh, there's a, a shit ton of interesting stuff there. And uh, if you're interested in this material, then have a look at them. Uh, otherwise, thank you again, and I'm happy to answer all the possible questions.